Hello, everybody. It's really nice to be here, especially after this fantastic opening that Aki just uh, did for us. So I think we all know what we're here in this session. This was a session that marks the legacy of Bill Hillier at this 25th year anniversary of the first Space Syntax Symposium in London. Given the enormous range of influence that Bill's ideas have had on the Space Syntax community and beyond, it has been designed around a small number of, the, of his past PhD students, each of whom will speak on an aspect of their work with Bill and how his ideas have guided them since then. I am honored to chair the session, which was organized by Laura Vaughan, by John Peponis, and Ruth Conroy Dalton. I will start by shortly introducing myself in relation to my contact with Bill and the syntax community, which I intend to do with each one of the presenters. My name is Margarita Green, and I was also one of Bill's PhD students. I arrived at the Bartlett at the end of the 80s as a qualified architect, having recently finished an MA in social <coughs> I worked at the unit and eventually did my PhD with Bill Hillier on the consolidation process of informal settlements. From there on, I have never lost contact with the syntax community while carrying on an academic career at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. My main interests have been on social housing, urban renovation, and sustainable urban development. Before I introduce you to the five selected PhDs supervised by Bill, I will take a few minutes to say my part of the influence of Bill's idea on my work. Since the time is impossibly short, I will restrict myself to only one but fundamental idea. I learned about Bill while I was living in Leeds in the north of England, and I read a paper by him in a journal, I don't remember which. But I was impressed by finding what I had been searching through my architectural studies, an analytical approach that linked the social phenomena with space. I had studied in an architectural school strongly oriented to design, with an emphasis on observation, description, and representation. Yes, they taught us how to observe and select and bring to the project a social spatial proposal, something that they called the act, sometimes it called the situation, it was even called something like the architectonic fact, el hecho arquitectónico, which is a bad translation. But it was always a discovery, highly evaluated, although it was, as Bill would say, non-discursive. It was very difficult to explain with words. In fact, the idea was that many times we would identify a spatial quality or condition that the future inhabitant or user of that space or territory would not even know that he or she needed or wanted. We were aspiring to a spatial innovation. I learned much about designing buildings, neighborhoods, giving them form, shape, so that it would respond to that which somehow I had detected but wasn't able to explain in words. In search of clarifying this phenomena, I felt I was missing something after I finished my architectural studies, and I did this MA in sociology. I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I was really surprised when at the end of my studies, I, was, I had to do my thesis, and I was very proud of the subject or theme that I had found. I was always interested in housing, social housing, so I brought to my tutors the idea to study the relation of the self-built housing, the household, and how people that were needed of houses uh, and that did not have a housing solution were building very complex households. So it was a very social spatial phenomenon to me. I was as surprised as surprised I was before in my architectural studies that the sociologists weren't really interested in it. They kept on saying to me, but why do you bother with that? It's really a social conflict that you're facing. And they didn't put their their, the importance to the spatial aspect, which I thought was priority. So really, it was the same thing again. In sociology, they didn't recognize the spatial aspects. In architecture, they didn't want to recognize the social aspects. So you can imagine, and I lost my... So you can imagine, now you will surely understand how fascinated I, I was when I read about Bill and Julian's social logic of space. And then pleasantly surprised when I met Bill and he invited me to show to the PhD students my thesis. Well, contrary to my previous teachers, he, he thought that it was really an advance, this mixing both social things. And from there on started my my 
linkage with the social community, uh, with the space syntax community. On this same line, and to finish this introduction, I want to recall the opening of the first space syntax symposium, right there, 1997, where Norman Foster said, and I quote, I love the world of analysis, observation of research, but also passion, imprecision, the hunch. Space syntax is the testing of the interaction of these opposing words, worlds, sorry. I have used this, this uh, quote many times when explaining space syntax and I still like it very much. These opposing worlds come together in space syntax. So I still think this is a very good introduction and I wanted to share it with you. So now let me introduce to you some of the Bill's former PhD students who will make their presentations. First of all we have Tao. Tao Yang arrived to the Bartet in 2003 and was supervised by Professor Bill Hillier for his PhD on the spatial definition of urban areas. He worked with Bill at the Bartlett and Space Syntax Lab, developing the normalized choice called Natch later. Later he returned to China and at the moment is an associate professor at Tingshua University. His interests focus on city information modeling, digital twin cities and future cities. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you everybody and a special thank you for Professor Green. I feel terribly sorry for my not being able to attend uh, this symposium in person due to the COVID-19. Fortunately, Nora, John, Ruth, Margarita, and Aki offered the online opportunity of sharing my experiences of studying and working with Bill. And I'm trying my best to be with you. I own a note to Professor Bill Hillier for guiding me to discover an academic path and to explore urban morphology creatively and constructively. When applying to Barnard in 2003, I had just graduated with MR from Tsinghua University and was still utterly ignorant of space syntax. But Bill selected me as his doctorate student and offered a scholarship came to me right after a brief telephone interview, making me my first step to the world of space syntax. All the details of the first meeting with Bill 19 years ago remain fresh in my memory. It was 24th September, a lovely autumn day at a Torrington place sitting before a square coffee table full of academic books and journals. Bill told me that I needed to prepare to climb an academic mountain and that I needed to warm up by reading sociological space. Then he emphasized that I should forget much of what I had read before. At that moment, I feel that was like a course in which a Kung Fu master teaches pupils to forget what they learned and to start fresh with meditation. The first few years of studying and working with Bill were years of a bit sweeter symphonies. After several years of day-to-day -day discussions with Bill, I fully understood the meaning of forgetting what I had read. He addressed a critical method of seeking regularity or enormity in experimental studies and experiments and developing potential theories from scratch and from the first principles by studying both how real cities and buildings function and the way we perceive and behave in spaces. In fact, Bill originally proposed that an analytic paradigm had to be developed in architecture. Critical to this was the idea followed from in hacking that we sometimes should not be contented to study evident phenomena, but should also strive to create them using our own instruments and methods. For example, our own ways of representing spatial relationships or morphologies of space occupancy and use. The, the Philosophical Intellectual Foundation and the pioneer spirits of Bill have inspired me each day during our work together and since. 
as a for the city as a complex systems, you can verify the spatial mechanism of images by introducing the concept of a configuration, the relationships taking account of other relationships, ranging from the local to a global, with an aim of investigating how urban parts interact with each other at various scale to generate city as a whole. He showed me how to identify urban patterns and regularities by focusing on configuration variables at different scales. He also showed me how morphological regularities arise according to social morphological generators and have a social economic implications. For example, simple discoveries such as coordination of movement density and integration were creatively linked to the refinement of descriptive variables such as angular integration and that of analysis methods. The creation of a phenomena can be interpreted as new ways of representing, measuring, and even intervening. And on this way, we kept discovering new ways of describing phenomena and bring them under purview of a systematic analysis. Bill also taught me how to conduct a rigorous empiric study. When I showed a patchwork of patterns, meaning that group of neighboring lines tend to have a similar values and economy, and surrounded by discontinuities where values and so colors significantly change, made evident by the changing rate of node count. Bill asked me mm -hmm. to test other variables, such as metric mean depth and entropy, and to ensure whether the patchwork patterns were consistent phenomenon. In fact, the discovery of such patchwork patterns was also related to a methodology of a neighborhood detection as conducted by SHIP, according to a variable of a point of intangibility or synergy. Bill became convinced that a new and significant phenomenon, a kind of a discontinuity in urban network, had been identified. This provided a syntactic framework for explaining the morphological generation of distinct urban areas, such as districts, neighborhoods, and communities. We drew in his Jaguar, Jaguar to visit a city and London docklands to observe expressways and the canals, the green boundaries of communities and the historic named areas in order to empirically verify morphology of theoretical generated patches on the ground and to understand its implications. All of this, especially Jackie Wright, definitely helped me understand the significance of field study in the quantitative research on cities. In addition, Bill suggests that, that anomalies found in the analysis might act as a starting point for developing theory or methods further. When we found that some segregated spaces had the highest choice of value in the design project of a random area, we realized that the choice based on segment map needed to be normalized to make those segments comparable by incorporating effect of size in the analysis. We investigated the different behaviors of integration and choice as the sub-networks within the city grew in size. One day, Bill suggested me to rethink the morphological meaning of the D values. I suddenly figured out that the betweenness centrality can be treated as a benefit and the closeness centrality as a cost. The benefit cost ratio could then be defined and used as a dimensionless variable. This variable, which later became uh, called a notch, solved the problem of normalizing choice. Within integration also normalized, we could identify the foreground and the background of urban area with greater ease and assurance. This had been abstracted as a star model Meanwhile, we identify the two parametric viable distribution as a function of describing the growth of urban grids in which one parameter is denoted as a catchment area defined by the subgrids at a certain stage of growth. 
and another as a close news of each segment to others at that stage. We thus characterize the urban growth and the cast night on automated generation and diversification of urban networks. The idea of emerging structures was, of course, fundamental to build thinking from the very early development of foundation of a space syntax. In April 2019, he invited me to the Barbican. I had followed the yellow knights joined on the ground to help visitors find their way to meet him at his apartment with the elaborate and dedicated balcony garden created by the Shina, Bill's wife. Not surprisingly, he was still busy with working on the symposium paper about the different types of structures implicit in the graphic theoretical representation of networks, exploring a new direction for development of space syntax analysis. After discussion about the stability and the reproduction of a global spatial temporal structure in terms of organization of structure itself, Bill asked me to compare all the different ideas together to a final version. Unfortunately, this was our last face-to-face -face meeting. Although we had exchanged many emails on publication of a Chinese version of a sociological space. During this period, Bill continued to think about the theoretical cha challenges and especially the way in which a quantitative analysis might capture the different types of structure that characterize the different parts of spatial networks. For him, we have no means of assessing effect of a strong differences in form of a structure and its functional coordinates on, for example, economic and social performance of city as a whole. We can analyze the city to bring to light structures, but we cannot describe those structures in such a way as to make them comparable and detect relations to a global performance. More simply, we have no theory of structure. This is a problem at urban level. This paper was presented in the last symposium in Beijing. In my name and in the name of space syntax scholars and a practitioner in China, I express our deepest application to Bill. Many thanks to Margarita and to all of you. Many thanks. Hope the symposium be successful. Thank you very much, Tao. Uh, so now I will present to you the second PhD student that will present today his testimony. It's Vinicius Neto. He was a Bill student at the Bartlett at the turn of the new millennium. His PhD was about urban and architectural spaces as part of how we build societies as systems of action through semantic references and communication. Since then, Vini has looked into segregation beyond static residential territories, operating in the distinct daily trajectories of social groups in urban space. In short, he approaches cities as information, cooperation, and segregation networks. I leave Vinny with you. When I <laughs> learned about the session for Bill, I told Laura, Ruth, and John that I had never received an invitation that made me happier, and I meant it. I feel that the best way to thank them for this privilege is to respond to this special occasion by talking about Bill's role and influence on our trajectories as researchers and as a research field. Uh, although there are other ways to do this, I'm afraid I can only do so personally on this particular occasion in the presence of his colleagues, students, and friends, and Sheila. Of course, this occasion, our being here um, Darwin here is a celebration. So let me start by sharing some of my impressions of him as his student some 20 years ago. A lasting impression was of his thought when he was speaking with you. I think I haven't met another person with a mind as clear as Bill's. If for me the world was and still seems a bit opaque, a challenge to understand it, the word for Bill appeared to have no mysteries. So confident was he in explaining things around him. It was an absolute joy to hear him think aloud. He seemed able to understand anything using a thought imbued with endless relationality, constant materiality, and sociality. 
Now, how do you think with all these layers and materials like they were always already there simultaneously at work within the thing you want to understand? As much as these substances surround us, they seem to constitute and shape Bill's thoughts. And there was this tireless recursive way of thinking, like the search for ideas was his playground. Was it Bill who said that once we learn a new idea, we will never think without it? I also remember him saying things like, we are not afraid of throwing good ideas away. Or I went to this academic event, I talked to this group of people, and I threw this idea, I tested this idea on them. Perhaps not precisely in these words distorted by the labyrinth of memory. Nevertheless, one could see how his enthusiasm for ideas was enormous. It was authentic. We could watch him throughout the years, um, him engaging again and again with the most significant subjects, societies, space, cognition, and so on, relentless, always looking at the same thing, taking a different angle, finding new things, new versions of sets of relationships or new forms of description, finding excitement in those new versions and discoveries. This is perhaps the most admirable thing about him. How do you keep looking at the world with a sense of surprise? Look at the world with fresh eyes. That takes an ability, a disposition. Of course, children and students have the disposition. We are likely to lose that as we mature and naturalize the world to ourselves. It seems to me that Bill never quite did that. He didn't seem to grow used to this thing we are a part of. Back in those years, I wrote that Bill always seems like a student, seeing the world with fresh eyes. Those words are in my thesis and a book I later dedicated to him. And that's perhaps his biggest lesson to me. The key and most challenging thing to do is to take a step back and stop taking the way things around you work for granted. You constantly need fresh eyes. A feeling I have after these years about those interactions with Bill on research, which I'm sure many of you feel, is a wish to reenact those talks when you were forbidden to show up in his office in the morning, when you had the privilege of having a person at the peak of his intellectual powers give you regularly a part of his time and thoughts, the most precious things. I wish I had recorded those talks. I wish I could take them, I get back to them now more prepared. I wish I could emulate them today with other people. Today, I surprise myself trying to reenact those situations with my students when I unconsciously attempt to repeat that way of dialoguing. I pick myself trying to reach his clarity in my teaching and writing. Now, a word about Bill's theoretical work. Sociologist Robert Merton called the effect of the cognitive environment on the creation of sequences of ideas between different authors multiple discoveries. As far as I can decode it and trace its possible inspirations, Bill and his co-authors compose their theory creatively from the knowledge of many different disciplines and fields. We see the linguistic idea of a primacy of syntax over semantics and the restrictions on random processes in urban morphogenesis, reflecting the emphasis on signs rather than meanings in the view of information as the amount of freedom of choices governed by probabilities, a measure of the degree of randomness in Claude Shannon's information theory, the topological thinking of in cities as networks, as in Christopher Alexander, the use of graph theory to detect relational properties and in Linton Freeman's social network analysis. But Bill went so much further than any graph theorist in exploring those ideas spatially, like the idea that each space contains in its configurational nature a global relationality. And in the context of society, the concept of the individual and the social system as a single whole, seen from different prisms. He could theorize society up there with the best, the attention to co-presence as an elementary condition of social awareness, as in Goffman, the anthropological reading of codes of social cohesion via Durkheim's solidarities and Turner's communities, as inherently spatial, the view of societies as encountering systems and the focus on co-presence as fundamental to social reproduction. That was society seen in the, in the here and now, like Giddens' new structuration theory, the sociologic of space was theorized simultaneously, but with much more material depth. 
such a wide and diverse range of ideas informed by apparently incompatible fields, shaped into a single fabric of a theory. Think about that for a second, what it takes to navigate so freely in the realm of ideas. If my description is correct, the trajectory of these conceptions shows how, beyond combinatorics, a configurational logic is critical to new theories. Also at the moments of learning from different approaches to reach something greater than the sum of its parts. Now look around in the discipline of urban studies. The emphasis on movement and co-presence and the topological view of cities are everywhere. This collective effort has brought new scientific standards to empirical work, which were not usual in the discipline, apart from works in urban economics. The emphasis on objectively identifiable social and urban entities like pedestrians and co-presence and the deep view into spatial structures in cities and buildings allowed for study cases with large samples, urban areas or whole cities in extensive field work, finally offering empirical robustness. This collective effort seems to have changed the discipline and fields of practice along with it. And of course, it changed my view of cities and societies. I sought Bill because he was an original thinker and he inspired me to be a theorist. As his student, I tried to somehow extend or work outside the borders of his ideas. What else was out there to be discovered? What phenomenal areas were not explored, I felt stimulated by him to go in other directions. Before I even met him in 1999, I used Bill's focus on the elusive spatiality of movement and the temporality of the here and now to think of social segregation beyond static residential territories, operating instead in subtle but pervasive ways in the, in the distinct daily trajectories of social groups in urban space. With him, I explored the um, meaning in urban and architectural spaces as part of how we build systems of social action through communication. Since then, my colleagues and I have looked into the effects of buildings on the social life, the social life of streets and neighborhoods, and more recently, we've been exploring information theory to analyze morphogenetic paths and frequencies of cellular configurations in different spatial cultures, what Bill called distinctive ways of ordering space and explain the role of cities in how humans battle entropy by coordinating their actions and producing societies as large scale cooperation systems. As you can see, even though I've um, tried to find alternative and complementary ways, I've kept drawn to Bill's ideas and the developments in space syntax. Even considering how paths might unfold so differently, I feel that I grew in connection with colleagues and friends in this community, and I learned that it, it is good to be part of a community. Let me finish these thoughts by reminding something that sociologist Nicholas Luhmann said, something that would perhaps align with Bill's view that ideas are in things. Luhmann noted that the mode of existence of consciousness is the meaning it creates. Um, if he is correct, we are alive whenever our ideas circulate. So Bill keeps present. He's certainly present. Certainly present to me and I'm sure to many of us. And the fact that we are gathered in Bergen and connected across so many regions of the world is a testament to the beauty and power of his ideas. That's excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vinicius. That was beautiful what you said. Thank you for sharing. Now I will present to you the third of Bill's PhD students selected today. Ruth Conroy Dalton received her bachelor master's and qualified as a licensed architect before completing her PhD supervised by Bill Hillier in 2001. 
Since her PhD, she has worked on spatial cognition, carrying out research and developing cloud sources, navigation, game and application. See Hero Quest, played by over 4 million people today. She is currently Professor of Architecture at the Lancaster School of Architecture. Ruth, it's your turn now. Thank you, Margarita. Um, so for me, a key early memory of Bill took place when I was a master's student. And I recall sitting in a lecture room at UCL, listening to Bill present a research observational study. And I'm really sorry, I can't remember where now, other than it was an urban study and somewhere in London. And he had a slide of junction gate counts showing the split between one direction and another. And Bill was describing how, say, 15% of people entering the junction chose to go left, and I'm completely making this up now, 85% of people chose to go to the right, and how this was predictable by the space syntax measures calculated. <laughs> and I vividly recall sitting there thinking, yes, but why would I choose to go right and not left? I have free will. Would I do what everyone else is doing? Would I maybe be one of the 15% turning the other way? And why? Is this even testable? So for me, this precise problem of how to bridge between individual decision making and the aggregate observations of collective movement, as typical in space syntax studies, really became the focus of my interest and has sustained me now for many years. How do small scale individual spatial decisions aggregate to produce the collective patterns of movement that correlate with space syntax measures. So naturally it's clear, thanks to Bill, that a large proportion of pedestrian movement arises from the probabilistic effects of the urban spatial structure. As he identified, uh, and this is what he said, all other things being equal, movement flows in different parts of a street network are systematically influenced by the spatial configuration of the network itself. That was from a 1999 paper. And indeed, in a later paper of 2005, he elaborates, because results are about aggregate human behavior, it's always been unclear how far they depended on individual spatial decisions and how far they are simply mathematically probable network effects. So how do we start to, to detangle these two entirely separate phenomena, the effect of spatial configurations on the one hand set against our role as individuals making localized spatially embedded decisions? And why even consider these things separately? Because in doing so, we are able to reveal something about how we as humans make meaning of the external world. External world. In other words, the process of cognition. Now, Bill spent a lot of time talking and writing about the concept of meaning. And for me, this is precisely what the study of cognition particularly spatial cognition, is about the process of how we make the information in the world around us meaningful. As Bill said, our mental interaction with the spatial world engages abstract relational ideas as well as concrete elements. That was from a paper of his in 2012. And therefore it could be easily stated that Bill's lifelong pursuit of meaning in space syntax is perfectly synonymous with the field of study that I've more recently come to term architectural cognition. So for me there's been three key ideas influenced by Bill that have continually acted as the foundation for my pursuit of these kinds of questions. First is the idea that space should be an object of study in its own right. It is representable, measurable, describable, and quantifiable. For space syntax researchers, as we all are here, space is contained and bounded. It is limited, not an infinite void, and it's configurable, meaning that it's subject to and forms spatial relationships. And particularly through this last characteristic, space becomes meaningful. This leads directly to the second idea that's been important to me, this being the idea of space being a morphic language. Bill made the distinction between meaning arising from signification and significance. 
significance arguably being the more important of the two, whereby a spatial configuration acquires meaning through this act of comparing it, if you like, to a sort of back catalogue that we individually amass through a lifetime of direct experience of all instances of similar spatial configurations that we've previously encountered. Significance is about meaning acquired by comparison to sets of other similar things. It is about meaning communicated via patterns of arrangement. And finally, the third concept that I'd bring to this trilogy of ideas is that of the situated observer. And in particular, the idea that any spatial system appears different depending on where a situated observer is located. In other words, the rest of the spatial system may be close or far, depending on the structure of the system and the location of the observer. In other words, space looks different depending where you are. So for me, the combination of these three ideas are foundational to the study of spatial cognition or even architectural cognition. So let us briefly return to this idea of the situated observer. In this next quote, Bill is talking about cities, but his comments could just as easily be applied to complex buildings. This is what he said. Space in cities is about seeing and moving. We interact with space in cities both through our bodies and through our minds. Our bodies interact with the space network by moving about in it. Our minds interact with the city through seeing. By seeing the city we learn to understand it. We also see space and the city comes to exist for us also as a visually more or less complex object with more or less visual steps required to see all parts of it from all others and so as a system of visual distances. That was from a paper of his in 2012. So this is the idea that we visually experience any spatial configuration serially since we can only be occupying one space at a time and that we need to move from one space to another in in order to experience more and to build up a picture of the larger spatial system. It's clear that in this process we both remember the spaces we've already occupied whilst also making continual, inter infer continual inferences about the spaces that we're yet to explore. But these inferences are always based on what we've already experienced. So this process of continually integrating our memories, attending to different visual cues in the environment, whilst reasoning and forming judgments about the spaces around us is critical to the process of spatial cognition. This is the point I feel it might be useful to briefly talk about spatial cognition and architectural cognition. So when I talk about cognition, this refers to any of the higher level brain functions that begin to organize and structure the raw sense data, which represents our input about our surroundings. Spatial cognition research in particular is concerned with the acquisition, organization, utilization and constant revision of knowledge about spatial environments. One way for a lay person to understand what spatial cognition is about is that it's concerned with how all that stuff out there external to us gets in here is internalized in some manner and again this really resonates with much of Bill's writing about how we understand the city. For example when he observed how and this is what he said, we cannot easily grasp the patterns of organic cities when we see them all at once from above, but curiously when we walk about in them, and so we see them a little bit at a time, the very differentiation of their parts can make them easier to navigate than the patterns in which parts tend to be similar and in similar relations. From the inside, we often find the organic easier to understand, from the outside, the geometric. That was from 2012. So if we ask the question, what exactly is the connection between the immediate visual cues available from any one single location in the city and that city's larger spatial structure, we must of course be making reference to the measure of intelligibility. Now intelligibility, I think, is an astonishing concept. At face value, it almost seems a ludicrous proposition that there could be any meaningful connection between global spatial measures and local visual information. But the data, and by that I mean the correlations between intelligibility and connectivity, how this relates to people's experiences of and behavior in more or less intelligible environments, certainly suggest that intelligibility is a plausible mechanism. 
And it's we're only just now beginning to be able to test what might be, for example, the most salient local visual cues. For example, work by Wiener and Holscher in 2012 on the spatial attention and gaze behavior of people navigating a virtual world. They showed how people tend to visually fixate on not only long lines of sight, but also on parts of the scene that suggest imminent changes to the spatial geometry with features such as occluding edges and openings being particularly attention grabbing. Also work from Beatrix Emo on the degree to which we pay particular attention to long lines of sight or axial lines at street junctions, again also from 2012. So all of this work is beginning to provide compelling evidence for precisely how intelligibility might function. So thanks to Bill, we're now far closer to understanding how that stuff out there gets in here. We're also much closer to understanding how individual decisions made in spatially complex environments can emerge to form patterns of behavior that correlate with space syntax measures over and above mere probabilistic effects of the spatial network. But this is a journey that's very much still continuing and it's a journey that from my perspective has been built upon foundations originally laid by Bill and I feel there's still very much uh, huge amounts of work to be done in this area. So, thank you. Thank you very much Ruth, that was very good presentation of your ideas. So now we're going to our only, the only one of our presenters today that is here in person, Sophia. Am I? Yes, yeah. um, Sofia Tsarra, I will present her as well. She arrived to London from Greece and completed her PhD at UCL, supervised by Bill Hillier and Julianne Hansen. Today she's professor at the Bartlett UCL, so probably many of you know her there. Her research interests are on the cultural, political and cognitive aspects of architecture and urbanism. She's currently completing a co-edited book, Parliament Buildings, the architecture of politics in Europe. Sofia, it's yours now. Thanks, Margarita and Aki, and thanks to the organizers of the session for this opportunity. I'm honored to be part of this um, tribute to Bill. So my contribution focuses on two periods underlying my own interactions with Bill. My first encounter with him as an MSc PhD student at the Unit of Advanced Architectural Studies at the end of the 80s and um, early 90s. And second, I have, as his colleague at the Bartlett since 2011. In the time between the two periods and the two versions of Bill, space syntax evolved to an approach that has exercised great influence in architectural urban research and practice and in the disciplines that address the relationship between space and society. Bill presaged by some 40 years the contemporary interactions of architectural and urban advances with the sciences of complexity, and yet there are important differences between the two approaches. Sorry. I would like to bring out these differences by looking at these two phases of Bill, first as a teacher at the AES MSc, and second as a contributor to the Journal of Space Syntax, which I edited from 2011 to 2015. More specifically, I will refer to his theory lectures in the AES MSc course and his three papers that we published in JAWS. Writing about the change of the subtitle of the Journal of Environment and Planning B from planning and design to urban analytics and city science, Michael Batty explains that urban analytics is fast emerging as a core set of tools employed to deal with problems of big data, urban simulation and geodemographics. Existing in parallel to urban analytics, the science of cities is a better focus, going back to social physics as reflected in notions about scaling, rank size, allometry, and so on, and its analytical focus through fractal geometry, chaos theory, and complexity. As Patty explains, there are lots of uh, books on urban analytics, but there are very few that actually bridge the gap between big data and the kind of data that we need in order to think about cities strategically. 
In short, we have all the tools to deal with data generated routinely in real time, but we have none of the requisite theory, other than the most pragmatic, where we have bits and pieces of a science. The real challenge of urban analytics is to make sure we invent this science, as well as working with ways of using it to plan cities better. My purpose is not to compare Bill to this uh, fields, but to guard against Bill's work as being associated with these areas. I will attempt, however, a broad comparison. City science and urban analytics describe systems as emergent bottom-up processes with only occasional top-down centralized action. In contrast, Bill thought of space, describes space as the secret norm of society, defined as spatiotemporal encounter systems of fully independent and mobile individuals and transcending any individual. Society arises initially through devices for overcoming the spatial discreteness of individuals, first by creating some kind of spatial patterning and second by transpatial integration, but this time not as a cognitive device for understanding the world from a point in it, but as a means of constituting categoric differences among collections of individuals. There cannot be a theory of a city or architecture that is not at the same time a theory of the social. And there cannot be a theory of the social which is not at the same time a theory of description retrieval or re-embodiment. That is how individuals can describe, retrieve descriptions from shared forms and experiences and either re-embed them or creatively change them, arriving at new realities. So the notions of morphic language, long short models, and structure and order are really crucial in uh, Bill's theories. I argue that it is these notions that establish the difference between Bill's approach and city science and urban analytics. And I will discuss them in order to see how Bill's ideas can be extended towards the theory of design. So Bill taught a theory course that introduced students to scientific concepts and to theories of knowledge and developed the content year after year by working over material in the handout notes he gave to students. Even a quick look at these notes from 1988-89 shows that he used a consistent scheme of organization. So each text consists of six paragraphs, each numbered and headed by a topic sentence that captures the thesis that is in this paragraph. So what is interesting is not only the content of the lecture, but also the structure, the classification of concepts, the overlap of concepts uh, between lectures that were temporarily separated but uh, intellectually related. Was this six-part rule a constraint, I'm thinking now, that he practiced to order his arguments or a desire to orchestrate his reasoning through a repeated structure which the students would unconsciously uh, absorb week after week like an examiner? Or was it both? Bill had a unique way to grasp things as being logically structured and conceptually organized. Logical structure in language maps specific meanings into reality to see if they fit. The six-part rule, though, used natural language as morphic language, both to specify meanings and increase our awareness about the multicoded nature of the ideas, exploring possible meanings in their interrelationships. Morphic languages are systems where meaning arises out of syntax that results from simultaneous presence of uh, uh, relationships rather than extraneous associations. What Bill defined as the difference between significance and signification, two terms that he borrowed from Vitruvius, as I recently discovered. Deriving from the theory of probability, long and short models are defined by the length of descriptions necessary to describe syntaxes of morphic language. A highly ordered process uh, will have a long model like the Bororo village, and the less ordered one will have a short model like Pitirin. In buildings, this idea evolved into the weak and strong structure buildings, and in cities, this idea evolved to the notion of the dual grid in the generic city, which consists of the foreground economic network of retail markets and the background socio-cultural network of residential areas. The notions of structure and order distinguish between ideas that we 
uh, grasp when we live inside systems as special relationships and then conceptual structures that we can understand through the rational relationship between them uh, almost at once. The simplest form of order are the classifications which are about the simple binary distinction of whether an object belongs to a class or not. So for Hillier, order is associate, associated with both the organization of society uh, through spatial and transpatial groupings on the one hand and the logical patterning of spatial arrangements on the other. But how do these concepts inform or open up the imagination in architectural design? One idea, one particular answer is given by Phil Sedman based on the morphological theory proper. Stedman enumerates possible forms and asks why certain possibilities become actual forms while others are not. And two pathways open here as a response. One is Stedman's return to the model adding constraints because these do, the possibilities do not really correspond to some generic functional requirement. And the other is Healer's idea that the built forms that actually exist are not simply subsets of the possible, but variable expressions of the laws that govern the transition from the possible to the real. So both um, uh, pathways eventually converge, seeing built forms as being about constraints of possibility imposed by generic functions. So statements and Hillel's definitions of possibility refer to how it is mapped into the realm of necessity and the real. However, architecture does not simply correspond to the generic functions and does not really enumerate possibilities. So how can we proceed if we don't really enumerate possibilities? Proposing a theory of morphic uh, language out of syntax, Bill later extended into the aesthetic in the area of architecture and design. The aesthetic works by mapping onto reality to find not truth or solutions, but possibilities which give it significance. Architecture, like poetry, is about mapping into a genotypical family of architectural forms, both those which exist and those which are possible. We have therefore to set Sedman's model aside and follow Bill's idea of the construction of complex possibilities of meanings in the realm of architectural freedom. However, the two approaches are not opposed, as architectural freedom is about possibilities of meaning rather than freedom from constraints. In my work, I have defined buildings and cities as dual systems, consisting of a configurational structure of special properties and relationships of logical conceptual order, specifying membership of elements into classes. In a comparison between Mario Botta and Le Corbusier's houses, we see two pathways by which possibilities of meanings are achieved. The first one is where possibilities are used in such a way as the configurational structure and the logical order of elements support and inform each other. This is uh, uh, corresponding to a long model, which is both as architecture. The second is where configurational structure and conceptual order do not correspond but point to different directions, constructing ambiguities and many possibilities for meaning. The correspondences between configurational structure and conceptual order reinforce a single coded system, aiding description retrieval by single, by single multi layered code. Through repetition over space and time, these schemata become normative ideas, ideas we think of, the architectural imagination seeks to alter. The imagination is thus informed by a combinatorial syntax, where the relation between significance and signification is not precise, but strives for openness in the realm of architectural possibility and freedom. We recognize this in either domains of creative activity, as in Calvino's Invisible Cities, where um, objects, spaces, and events are um, shuffled, reshuffled into um, semantically and mathematically in order to uh, create unexpected meanings training the imagination. This, I believe, is a potential extension of Hillier's ideas necessary for a theory of design and of space syntax from a theory of architectural necessity to one of architectural freedom. Thank you. So now we've reached the last of our invited speakers. Fred de Holanda, Frederico de Holanda. He arrived to London as a qualified Brazilian architect. He carried out his Master of Science and PhD in Architecture at the Bartlett, both supervised by Bill Hillier. 
He's now Emeritus Professor and Senior Research Fellow at the University of Brasilia. He investigates relations between configuration of buildings and cities and social stratification. He has published several books, among them one dedicated to Bill and another to Julian. It's a great pleasure and honor to, to be in this round table as a tribute to, to Bill, uh, together with Margarita, Tao, Vinicius, uh, Ruth, Sophia, uh, thanks so much, uh, Ruth, Sophia, John, and Laura to uh, put together this uh, session. And uh, great to see you, Martha Helia and Sheila Helia, uh, with us here as well. Uh, I rank among those who had the privilege to meet Bill Helia decades ago when the expression space index first appeared in print form. That was the year of 1976. And the place was the fascinating intellectual environment formed by him, Julian Hansen, Adrian Lehman, Alan Beatty, and other colleagues at the Bartlett. I have since uh, been greatly stimulated by his seminar ideas, first as his MSc student, then when he supervised my MSc uh, thesis, and then my doctoral dissertation. For my great joy, our relationship did not end here, for we met often again in Brasilia, London, Atlanta, Stockholm, Istanbul, Santiago. I have considered a list of adjectives, adverbs, and metaphors to try and convey how important he was to me, both academically and personally. Found none, either because they were too shallow or too pompous, or perhaps because I think he hated the three species. His theory is built upon verbs and substantives. Bill's contribution raises the bar of the social importance of architecture, and in doing so, he establishes new levels of ethical responsibility in design. Surely architecture is made of brick and mortar. It is an inanimate phenomenon. Surely people are made of flesh and bones, they are living organisms. Physical properties of building materials affect the comfort of our bodies as biological entities, and the contribution of the natural sciences to architectural phenomenon legitimately defines lines of research in academia. However, Bill does not approach architecture through the lenses of natural or biological sciences. Rather, he does this through the lenses of social sciences. For him, not only uh, architecture, but society itself is an artifact, configured through recognizable patterns of bodies deployed in space and time. True enough, societies as encounter systems are not new in the literature. Remember Pierre Bourdieu's social capital we are positioned in society according to cultural, economic, and political resources we can mobilize, but also through the networks of social contacts to which we belong. This is Bill's uh, system of encounters and avoidances, but now through analytical categories which allow for their fine-tuning approach as arrangements, large, small, hierarchically defined, horizontally structured, in daily life, in exceptional circumstances, actual, virtual, all qualified by social labels superimposed on people. Notwithstanding the virtual mode of relationships, encounters happen in actual places the order of which modulates our movement in space through barriers and permeabilities and our awareness of others through transparencies and opacities. This happens at all scales, from small buildings through settlements to the natural landscape, as Lucy Donegan shows concerning the social choreography in urban beaches. The possibilities and restrictions instituted by architecture go far beyond appearances and matters of style, the hegemonic approach in architectural literature. Against the mainstream, 
the focus is now directed towards the ordering of space, which is, quote, really about the ordering of relations between people, end quote, opening paragraphs of the social logic of space. Not an easy task. As Michael Bennett notes, it takes years of training for architectural students to be instilled with an oculocentric, solipsist experience of places so that they can draw their projects without people or wait for a shot of an existing building until nobody's around. The images of any publication on the, quote, architecture of power and taste, end quote, in Gary Stevens' words, illustrate the point. When Bill and Julian put people back in, they stress the importance of the couplet architecture body arrangements as one of the most telling instances by which society's identity is constituted, recognized, and reproduced. The obvious corollary is the addition of a type of capital that has not deserved a place of pride in Bourdieu's oeuvre, architectural capital. Inspired by another master of mine, the Brazilian philosopher Evaldo Coutinho, I suggest architectural capital is twofold. There are end elements, ordered space in which we are, through which we move, and in which we are aware of other people. Ordered space is the ultimate uh, being the ultimate aim of architecture and the forte of space index theory. I call this spatial capital. And two, there are mean elements, volumetric features, which by practical necessity define the voids. I call this building capital. However, if such physical elements have a supporting role in architecture, their materials, finishings, color, texture, size, form, are also constitutive of power and taste, that is, of the habitus, the overarching Bourdieu's concept that encompasses modes of having, acting, thinking, and feeling, which distinguish subjects and locate them in social space. The above reasoning, the above reasoning implies we should avoid a moaning mode, which laments a situation without considering that places are social constructs. It is as if simply bad professionals or bad knowledge were the source of bad environments. There certainly is incompetence around us, but this is not the crux of the matter. When it comes to the habitus, both pedigree architecture and the anonymous social production of buildings and settlements, may constitute one and the same architectural paradigm. For example, gated communities in Brazil cut across class status. Now, if we are to leave the moaning mode and embark on a critical mode, we must for a moment zoom out from the environment and not focus on the environment per se, but rather on the habitus to which the environment belongs as one of its constitutive elements. What paradigm is being embraced by the social subjects in question? In the critical mode, we are not simply analysts of an, of an environment. We are critics of society, but focusing in one of the forms it materializes, architecture and social arrangements. We must act as the social subjects we are struggling in a social milieu, fighting for a certain habitus, identifying our allies as much as our adversaries and confront them. Otherwise, we run the risk of picking the ineffective wrong battles and, uh, <clears throat> and in the worst scenario uh, of adopting a naive stance and preaching in the desert. Concrete reality, artifactual phenomena. These are perhaps good catchwords to convey Bill's vision of architecture and society. Sociological or historical literature, 
often registered society as power struggles among social classes or ways of expressing ideas or modes of producing material goods. But none of such processes happen in a void. They do not occur in some sort of insubstantial ether, but are deployed in space and time and qualified by them. As Julian, Bill, and Hilary Graham once put it, quote, ideas are in things, end quote. Notwithstanding specific theories or interpretations, praiseworthy as they are, what I cherish most from Bill's teaching is this. I have relearned to think about architecture and, by the same token, about human society. His influence in my thinking was rather in the field of epistemology, rather as knowledge about knowledge than knowledge about the world. Philosophy rather than science. In my name and in the name of Bill's academic children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren who constitute research groups in Brazil, in Brasilia, Goiânia, Recife, Natal, João Pessoa, Rio de Janeiro, Niterói, Fortaleza, Florianópolis, Porto Alegre, Pelotas, Belém, and possibly other cities, I say we are forever grateful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Fred. Wonderful presentations we've had. Right. We have heard many ways in which Bill's ideas marked the selection of ex-PhD students, and I am sure if we invite other of Bill's students, they will add many more. Each one of the five presentations selects a number of concepts which somehow opened a new train of thoughts to each one of them. While Tao emphasizes the morphological aspects, how to identify urban patterns and regularities, focusing on configurations and the social and economic implications, the empirical approach, the search of new and rigorous methods of describing phenomena, Vinnie underlines Bill's constant generations of new ideas, the understanding of restrictions on a random process, the topological thinking, the co-presence as a first step to social awareness. On the other hand, Ruth, intrigued by what Bill described as natural movement, pushed her to spatial and later architectural cognition. She described it as how we make sense of the world and make individual decisions and how these later emerge in aggregate observations of collective pattern movement and correlate with space and text measurements. Sophia starts from a similar perspective than Ruth, addressing the step between the discrete mobile individuals to the arising of society, but centers on the description retrieval necessary for this theory that is simultaneously of the city and of the social. Lastly, Fred goes back to that one basic paradigm shift, which was to state that architecture, much more than ordering space, but was really about the ordering of relations between people. This very brief and totally incomplete review of the five testaments demonstrates at least two rather surprising aspects. The first is that in spite of the rich testimonies, which offered various perspective concepts, observations, there are almost no overlap between them, nor contradiction. Each one seems to have been inspired by an incredibly complete theoretical and methodological framework initiated by Bill and Julianne, and followed by a very special group of researchers who were the basis of the syntax community, some of them present here today. The second is that I am sure that if we brought other of Bill's PhD students, they would have added other concepts or ideas. In fact, I must mention that there is a very special PhD student, John Pepones, in fact, Bill's first PhD, as I understand, whose testimony is missing today, but is pending for some future date. We're waiting for it. But let's go back to some of the non-mentioned of Bill's ideas, the beady ring, the deformed wheel, the distinction between inhabitants and visitors, which I've always found extremely interesting when observing residential communities, the inverted genotype, the, the difference between generative and conservative buildings, the visible college or the virtual community. 
Of course, I can see that many of the aspects mentioned today were closely related to the terms I am suggesting. But what I am trying to say is that if you were impressed by these testimonies, I can tell you that there is much more. And this brings me to my impression from my first encounters with Bill's ideas. I remember going to the theory lectures that Sophia mentioned. They finished late, or at least many times it was already dark when I started a one-hour trip back home. Nevertheless, the 60 minutes seemed to pass really quickly because I was rethinking what Bill had presented to us, but now from my own experience. My feeling was that with each one of these lectures, Bill opened new ways of looking at my memories, new windows in my mind, perceptions and experiences enriching my past and, of course, future experience. In fact, after these, I could not go to a social gathering or to a wedding or a beach in summer without observing the positioning of the people, the movement patterns, the co-presence, visual fields, etc. That is, Bill's lectures had changed the way I observed and understood the world. In fact, I used to compare the experience to other, let's say, more traditional lectures. Living in London, I wanted to make the best of the experience and would go to many lectures. I remember listening to a lecture on mud skyscrapers in South Yemen, which before going to the lecture, I didn't know even existed. Uh, after the lecture, I knew something about them. I had new knowledge. Nevertheless, it did not change my way of understanding the world. On the contrary, with Bill, it isn't that I learned about the Bororo village, which I did, but that I learned how the positioning and classification of the dwellings replicated and transmitted culture and society through generations by restrictions on the random process. Similarly to what we do when in the private domain of the house, we teach our children to eat at the table or to address the elderly. But I feel that I have to finish this session with something more, with how Bill marked us all by being Bill. I mean Bill as a person. When I was invited to chair this session, I knew each of the speakers would make a robust presentation of how Bill's ideas had marked them, which was what they asked us to do. But maybe they would not mention how Bill had marked them as a person. I was wrong. Several of the, of the testimonies have referred to Bill's example as a teacher, as this bright mind that was sharing and challenging at the same time all of his students, was an inspiration to all of us. Also, I did not realize that if trying to summarize Bill's ideas was difficult, it was much more difficult to try to summarize him as a person. But anyway, I committed myself to it and I will try to say something about it. On the one hand, there is the obvious. He was a wonderful teacher. But I am not, I am not referring to attributes that could be normally associated to a good teacher, such as patience, nor subtlety to let you know when you were mistaken. On the contrary, he was not a diplomat, nor would hide his displeasure from what he did not like. Second, he was not a simple person, nor easy to understand. But we soon learned how to interact with him. I think it was Tao that mentioned that we were not allowed to talk to him during the mornings. I mean, not even to say hello if you crossed him in the corridor, which was complicated. Third and most important, Having such clarity and analytical mind, together with a passion to understand the world, and as I mentioned before, little patience, he was extremely generous in opening his mind, showing us what he was thinking and listening to our contributions. That is not so common in the academic world, I must say. That is what I think has been so important for building this community, and that is what makes me believe that is his greatest legacy. He left us a set of theoretical ideas, innovative concepts and observations, to, together with a methodology for observing, representing and analyzing the social-spatial phenomena that is not closed, but open for all us to follow and enrich. Contrary to what one would have thought, it is eminent, bottom-up, top-down, continuous flow of enriching knowledge. Lastly, and I have to say, especially because Sheila is here, he was a wonderful traveler. Together with my husband and Bill's wife, present today, Sheila, we made some beautiful trips, we tasted good wine, and we had a wonderful time. We are going to miss him a lot. 
Thank you.